Yeah, thank you for everyone. I want to thank all the panelists that are here with us today. Uh, before I move into the introductions of the topic and of a uh, very experienced and very knowledgeable panel, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Maxim Vikramasinghe. I am president of Slider Youth and I'll be your moderator today. Um, I represent uh, the newly started youth wing of Slido, which is the Sri Lanka Association of Inbound Tour Operators. Our goal since our inception has been to push the sustainable development of Sri, uh, or in, through Sri Lanka's tourism industry through educational webinars such as this and industry-wide initiatives. Our parent body is the, is the apex body for Sri Lankan tour operators. And over the last few months uh, to try and face the challenges that we have, we have come with the One Industry, One Voice initiative. With, through other member groups within the industry, we have joined together to, uh, to set up one, um, one, one Voice to combat many of the issues we are currently facing in this uncertain climate. Um, the topic we'll be discussing today is adventure travel in Sri Lanka, the potential and possibilities. In Sri Lanka, we are absolutely blessed. Even being a tiny island, we have a beautiful coastline, which is home to some of the best surfing and kite surfing spots in the world, as well as with brilliant diving potential with our reefs and historic shipwrecks. In addition, we have plenty of wildlife in all of our uh, national parks, as well as our central highlands, which offer some of the best hikes, waterfall, and trails to delight any adventure enthusiast. Adventure travel has been an extremely lucrative and a market segment that has been growing exponentially within tourism. Travelers nowadays are out for experiential uh, tours where they have various, uh, various adventures and experiences that will get their blood rushing. So to speak about the topic today, we have a brilliant panel with, a, with vast experience in the industry. Uh, to start off with Mr. Tilak Virasinghe, who I think amongst all Sri Lankans doesn't need much uh, introduction. He's the founder of Lanka Sports, founder and chairman, sorry, of Lanka Sports Rising, uh, Sports Rising and is a true pioneer and legend of our industry. He has been recognized for his massive contribution with the Presidential Award for Outstanding Leisure Sports Provider in Sri Lanka for 2015. In addition, he has brought Sri Lanka, he has brought various prestigious events to Sri Lanka, um, such as the Tea Cup, the South Asia's only UCI endorsed cycling event, Rumble in the Jungle, and the Colombo Marathon. In addition, he is a Sri Lankan windsurfing champion and a true, true enthusiast of all adventure sports in Sri Lanka. And next we have Mr. Peter Miller, who established No Roads Expeditions in 2003 on the island of Lombok in Indonesia. From there, No Roads Expeditions has expanded to Papua New Guinea, Timor Leste, uh, Nepal, Europe, and South America. Peter's focus has always been on remote adventures from trekking to kayaking and even mountaineering. Peter was first introduced to Sri Lanka three years ago by Stuart Krelsham, who is on our panel here today. After visiting, they realized the, the vast potential of a, for remote adventure travel in Sri Lanka. And from, and from there, they saw that there, had, there was a certain lack of infrastructure. And to do this, they have set set up Hidden Trails Sri Lanka to try and bring adventure travel tourists towards Sri Lanka. Next is Stuart Krelsham. Stuart Krelsham was interestingly born in Kandy, uh, but migrated to Australia. And since then he had, he joined No Roads Expeditions in 2007 and is now the co-founder of Hidden Trails Sri Lanka with Peter Miller. He's an assistant chief fire officer at in, in Vangaretta, Australia, in the northeast of Victoria. He has been on the front lines of uh, various, uh, various fire emergencies, such as the uh, wildfires we saw in Australia earlier this year. Through this, he, is, he has the highest level of emergency management practice, he's a highest accreditation of emergency management practitioner. Um, Stuart has also guided many expeditions to Papua New Guinea on the grueling Kokoda track and, ha and he has, uh, he has uh, taken various medical expeditions as well to carry out, um, to carry out uh, 
yeah, to carry out CSR on behalf of the No Roads, Exped uh, no Roads Expeditions Foundation. In Sri Lanka, Stuart as well has uh, set up various training programs to help guides, uh, upcoming guides within the community, teaching them health and safety and elevating uh, quality standards within Sri Lanka. Our other panelist is Chris Saunders. He has been passionate about seeking new adventures from a young age and has been after that rush of adren adrenaline it provides. Motivating others to join and chase that rush has been one of his key driving factors. He has always had a love for diving and marine conservation, which has led him to, um, led him to start studying marine ecology and conservation at the university. And this is what led him to set up Arc Adventure. After working in both Thailand and Mexico on marine conservation, he wanted to create Arc to be a sustainable diving and adventure holiday uh, company, which sets up niche conservation focused uh, efforts as well as concentrating on the ethics of diving. His ambition is to one day set up a similar operation within Sri Lanka. And following up on that, we have Julian Carnell. He's a co-founder of Large Minority Adventure Travel, a company that specializes in group adventures, challenges around the world from, tuk from driving tuk-tuks across Sri Lanka, India, and Cambodia to sailing in the Philippines and exploring the Amazon rainforests. He's a, his pioneering Lanka challenge tuk tuk adventure was the first of its kind in Sri Lanka and maybe across the world as well, which has paved the way for tuk tuks to be one of the vehicles of choice of adventurous young travelers in Sri Lanka. He also believes in giving back to the community and all of his adventures have a direct portion of revenue which goes straight back into the local community. We also have Mr. Jake Pinfrock. Finny Frock, who is joining from America. Um, he's the Asian Reg Asia Regional Director of the ATTA, Adventure Travel Trade Association. Today, the ATTA stands at more than 1,300 networks, uh, uh, members in more than 100 countries, from tour operators, tourist boards, special specialist agents, to accommodation providers. The ATTA members, as well as the ATTA, share a global love for, global, for exploration and a vested interest in sustainable development of tourism. They have also done tremendous amounts of training and inspiring the adventure travel community. And last but not least, we have Diran Varnakulasuria, the manager of Nature Odyssey, a leading adventure travel DMC in Sri Lanka, which focuses on adventure-based tours all around the country. They are part of Walker's Tours, one of the country's oldest and most prestigious DMCs with a vast amount of experience in the trade. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining. I know y'all are joining from all around the world at, very, uh, at, different, uh, at different times. We are extremely grateful to have y'all have, have you here with us. So thank you very much. And now to start off, just to uh, let y'all know how we'll be uh, proceeding, we will be asking a round of questions from all of our panelists here today. And if the, if the audience has any questions, please do send it to us over chat and we will see if time permitting, if we can answer these questions. So uh, we'd like to start off with Mr. Tilak Veerasinghe. Um, from the introduction, I think Mr. Tilak is a clear pioneer of adventure travel in Sri Lanka. Mr. Tilak, we'd love to know about your journey and what it took for you to become an industry leader and what you see the potential for adventure travel in Sri Lanka in the next few years. Mr. Tila? Hello? Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. perfect. Right. Yeah. Um, no, uh, from my young days, I was involved with the swimming, life saving, then with all the water sports, including underwater and the surface sport. From there, I start to learn about nature sports. Then, uh, then I select all this for my you know, professional career too. And today, I am running a travel firm uh, with all this interest. And actually, I found that Sri Lanka is blessed country. We have a throughout the year. We have a warm water. And if a one side of the country 
if we have a monsoon on the other side of the country, Bay of Bengal side, we have a calm sea. So it is the destination for throughout the year for different activities. It is from uh, the you know surface, very calm surface to the rough surface. Within a few hours, we can go to the ocean-based activities. And when it comes to land-based or even inland water-based, we have a lagoons we have, that is throughout the year again. Then we can do kite surfing almost eight to nine months a year. Then surfing about 10 months a year, either east coast or southwest coast. Diving tend to actually around. And with all that, we started our activities and today we had grown uh, to a certain level. So we are into water-based, nature-based, then also to the biking, hiking, canoeing, kayaking. And in future of Sri Lanka, of course, as long as we develop our adventure trails, adventure areas, with uh, you know, carefully we have to develop, and uh, we shouldn't overcrowd because most of the surfing beaches in the world have a different issues. Therefore, we are a bit careful. We have our association, we have formed our structure, so we help each other. Uh, we are we are trying to develop uh, and looking the future. Uh, forward uh, uh, you know to take this forward in the activities because we are blessed by the right uh, environment here and um, if you think about the way forward i think we need uh, a lot of training so we have started our adventure training centers even the sri lanka tourism has taken Adventure sports or the leisure sports as the serious uh, segment of tourism. So we start to train our guide and our chauffeurs and also the people who are into activities and they are training to a different level. So these are some of the activities what is happening. Thank you, Mr. Veer Singh. Um, now I would like to actually ask a question from Diran, who is based in uh, Sri Lanka as well with Nature Odyssey. What would you say in, in terms of your experience are the major strengths and weaknesses for, of Sri Lanka as an adventure travel location? Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this discussion. Um, before I start, I must say that I'm not an expert, but I will share my knowledge based on the experiences that I've had uh, in dealing with adventure groups during the past couple of years. Um, if moving on to your question, I think Sri Lanka has good potential of becoming an adventure destination. I think in your introduction also, you mentioned about the uh, diversity of the landscape. You know, if you look at our mountains and peaks, there's plenty of them which enables um, activities like trekking and hikes is, is a possibility. Then if you look at uh, some of the other uh, nature resources that we have, we have a vast ecosystem of rivers um, numbering to 103, which gives us ample of opportunity to do activities like rafting, kayaking, all of that is also possible. Uh, then on the other side, we also have waterfalls, so many waterfalls in different parts of the country. Um, so that allows us to, um, you know, do activities like abseiling, uh, you know, caving is also something that is uh, becoming very popular. Uh, the next thing, um, my next point is that uh, our rich biodiversity adds an additional uh, sense of uh, uh, adventure to any any activity that we do. For example, if you're on a hike on in Knuckles and you see an uh, endemic species of bird, that gives you a sense of uh, additional value to whatever experience that you're offering. Uh, likewise, if you're if you're if you're doing a trail in the Udawalave area, you're most likely to see some elef uh, herds of elephants, which adds an element of adventure to it. Um, if I move on, the next point is that. The fact that we can combine many activities together, for example, if you look at uh, uh, rafting, you could do it easily. You have, uh, you can look at trekking. You have, uh, you know, multi-activity tours 
that could be done in one destination within a limited amount of time. That is, I think, something very special so that you can cater not only to a cycling enthusiast or a uh, trekking enthusiast, you can cater to a wider range of uh, adventure activities. Um, the next thing is that I feel that uh, the low risk of natural disasters uh, helps us to promote uh, adventure tourism in our country. And also in the recent past, as much as we see a lot of hotels coming up in big scale, like 200, 250 rooms, if you really look deep, you could find put, um, campsites, you could see eco lodges uh, in various parts of the country, which has come up, which blends in well uh, with this adventure uh, tourism that we are talking about. So these are some of the things that I've actually thought of uh, why Sri Lanka is um, good as an adventure destination. Um, I, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Dilan. I think, you know, we're all very, uh, very glad to be especially working and working with a country that has so much to offer. Um, my next question is for Peter Miller from No Roads Expeditions. Uh, Peter, I just want to know just a bit of your background and how you basically got into adventure tourism, your journey, and why you believe in Sri Lanka being a top destination. And maybe as well, you could probably share a bit of insights on why, um, what you would, a uh, bit of advice maybe you'd give for anyone looking to start up treks or start up adventures in Sri Lanka. Mm, great question. Uh, my my background is that I've been travelling like this all my life, um, going into remote areas and trekking and uh, hiking, paddling, uh, climbing, and um, but I didn't do that as a living. I actually became a firefighter in in Melbourne in in Australia uh, for about twenty years, and then realised that life's a little bit too short, and maybe we should um, follow our passions. And that's always been my passion. So. Uh, I left the fire brigade and uh, started up um, a, a business, or at the time it was a small business, um, No Roads Expeditions, and we started in Indonesia, yeah, and basically it was just doing exactly what I was passionate about. So I'm going to answer the third question first, in a sense, um, for those who are looking at getting into whatever you're doing in life, uh, I think you've got to start with passion. Yeah, and if you have a passion behind you, then you can get through all the hard stuff. And the hard stuff is the very beginning when there's resistance of people telling you that you can't do it. Uh, you don't have any skills, you don't have any money, you don't have any of this sort of stuff. If you're passionate, you'll do it. Yeah, so um, that's my, my great, my only real advice for people uh, who want to start a business is if you're passionate, follow your dreams. Yeah. And Tilak, I'm sure it was the same. Yeah, he just loved doing water sports and swimming and all that sort of stuff. And that's what gets you through the hard times, yeah, is um, passion. Um, um, and then, yeah, so then I started the business in Lombok and um, I discovered that uh, there were other people out there that liked doing it too, right? So, uh, and they liked me putting adventures together. So that's how we started in Indonesia. Then we went to Papua New Guinea, which is a super remote, um, very difficult place to operate um, um, because they have no infrastructure. They have really no, other than water sports, um, really no heritage for um, tourism. Uh, there are no roads that are connecting the capital city of Port Moresby to anywhere else in the country. So you have to fly or catch a boat. So there's really, it's a very difficult place to operate. Um, but again, people really liked it. And, um, and that's where we really grew our business was in Papua New Guinea. Uh, and then we expanded obviously into um, places like Timor-Leste, other parts of Indonesia, Nepal, Europe, and into South America. But then I was um, a, a friend of mine, Stuart, who's on the panel tonight, he uh, is from Sri Lanka. He used to be a guide or still a guide with no roads. And he said, hey, let's go to Sri Lanka. And to be honest with you, at the first, I'm thinking Sri Lanka, there's a lot of people, there can't be much nature. What has it got to offer? I didn't really know much about Sri Lanka, right? Well, I went, yeah. And Sri Lanka is gifted with a lot of great stuff for adventure travel. 
It really is, yeah. Now, I'm not into the, I mean, I do a lot of sea kayaking with um, parts of my business, but my main passion for Sri Lanka is your mountainous areas in the central part of Sri Lanka. And um, that has a lot, a lot of potential, yeah. And you know what, um, getting back to what Diran was saying, we were, you know, that there are, there is a lot of stuff to do in Sri Lanka, but you know, a lot of the stuff that attracts people to Sri Lanka isn't the adventure in the start. It's your culture, your food, great food. Yeah. And now after the civil war, it's a peaceful place pretty much. Right. So great people, right. It's a people place and great food and great culture. That's what you have as a base. Right. And then you have all of this other stuff, adventure stuff, um, that you can offer on top of that. So for people who go on adventures, it's not just about the adventure. Like people who go to Nepal who want to go trek to Everest Base Camp, it's not just about Everest Base Camp. It's the culture and the food and the people that make the trip, right? And Sri Lanka has that too, right? So there's a lot of great stuff that Sri Lanka has. Um, I was just looking at a map. Um, one of my one of my favourite areas um, of, of Sri Lanka is near Horton's Plains and um, the the Peaks Wilderness Sanctuary. I've been talking to Max and and Stuart about this for a long time. The Peaks Wilderness Sanctuary is untapped, and this is an area that needs to be opened. It needs infrastructure. It needs hoteliers. It needs guest houses. It needs guides to be trained. That is a gold mine there, you know. So, anyway, as you can see, Sri Lanka. Thanks, Max. Brilliant, Peter. Thank you so much for that introduction and and sharing your love for Sri Lanka. Uh, the next question I would like to ask is Stuart, who Stuart, who's been working with uh, Peter and who helped co-found Hidden Trails Sri Lanka. Um, Peter, you, I mean, sorry, Stuart, you've started off as a guide in um, in Papua New Guinea, and you have since then come to Sri Lanka and worked with a lot of local guides. What do you what do you think would be what do you think customers look for in a trekking guide or adventure guide and how would you say how would you say is the importance of you know health and safety for for guides and and would you have any tips and tricks for guides in terms of you know gaining knowledge on health and safety etc thanks maximum great question um i'll probably answer the second one uh uh first and that's all uh, there's a there's a uh uh, a theory called Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and and Maslow uh, was a uh, a philosopher who talked about um, the progression of a person, and and at the bottom you can't people can't enjoy themselves or develop or open their insights unless you get the basics right, and the basics is a place to go to the toilet, a place to eat, a place to uh, to shower and wash, etc. Above that is then safety. So people need to be feel safe. So you know, in, in relation to the to, to the foundation building box of every guide, a guide has to get the logistics right of those basics, and then it has to ensure that the people feel safe. The second thing is about um, uh, the uh, uh, the importance of the guide and the and the development of the guide. And there's a famous saying that people uh, will forget what they see, they will forget what they hear but they will never forget how they feel. And that's the role of the guide. The guide is to, to inject this feeling of, of, uh, of adventure, of, um, uh, of being important, etc. You know, when, when people come back uh, from Sri Lanka who have toured with me, you know, yes, they talk about Adamus Peak and yes, they talk about uh, the, the elephants and et cetera, but they, they really talk about the people, the people, how welcoming they were. You know, the characters, uh, the diversity uh, across the board. So, you know, the, the role of the guide is to introduce uh, uh, and host our, uh, our guests to Sri Lanka, to the, to the people, and, uh, and then you can't lose. Everything else above that becomes a bonus. Yeah, just a small follow-up to that. Like, so, Stuart, you've worked a lot with uh, Sri Lankan guides, training them, providing them, uh, tips and tricks on health and safety and just, you know, just what you just mentioned. Uh, how do you see the potential of Sri Lankans? And do you see, you know, language barrier, which is often one of the issues? Do you see it as a 
big challenge or is it something that can be overcome? Oh, I think it's very much something that be overcome. Um, now, one of the beauties of the, the, the Sri Lankan uh, uh, people is they're, they're, they're very uh, uh, um, uh, they are virtual, their they're hand movement, their they're gestures, etc. And, uh, and, uh, and that means a real lot to, to people. Um, the, the, probably the challenge to a, an up and coming guide is uh, to understand that they can actually get out of their comfort zone. Um, that there is a, a very much a, uh, when, when I work with the other Sri Lankan guides, uh, we, we are very much a team and they are my eyes and ears, etc. And sometimes I find that the Sri Lankan guides can, uh, can not speak up because of respect because they see me making a mistake or an error and they don't want to speak up out of, out of respect. Um, but to a certain extent, that disrespects me because, uh, you know, they're, they're, it's really important that I get that feedback, that I can uh, become better at what I do and that, that we are very seen as a team. So I hope that answers your question, Max. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for those insights. You know, it's, uh, I think, yeah, like you said, it's one of the most important things, you know, especially in these trekking expeditions and venture-based tourism is having a good guide and and uh, yeah, thank you for those points. I'm sure it'll be very helpful for a few people. Um, my next question is from Chris Saunders, who is the co-founder of Arc, Dive, Ad, Arc Adventure. Um, Chris, how do you, I mean, I'm sure you've dived all around the world. And I just want to ask, how do you see Sri Lanka's potential to be a premier diving site? Because we do have, you know, uh, you know, abundant reefs. And especially, I think one thing we have is shipwrecks so how do you see sri lanka's potential as a diving destination chris this is for sri lanka i think it is one of the places that is almost unknown in the diving industry and um, obviously people have heard of sri lanka but no but when you come to the diving you hear of the great barrier reef and you hear of the mesoamerican barrier reef going down south america and they're the places that people are like wow that's where i want to go diving but i think with a bit more of education, people can see just how wonderful Sri Lanka uh, diving is as well. With, you think you've got a coastline of about 1500 kilometers and just on nearer to the coast, 2% of that has got reefs, which accounts for 32 um, kilometers of coastline, just close to, um, you know, almost a short boat journey away where you can go diving. And the beauty with the the two seasons, obviously, you can be diving one side of Sri Lanka during monsoon season, one side, and, and vice versa. So there's always a, a good window to go diving. Um, and people within diving, they're, a bit, they're all a bit, a bit like David Attenborough. We've all got a passion for marine conservation and educating people on the importance of this. And as with problems in other countries, I've travelled to... Like, so um, it was in my introduction about Mexico and, and Thailand. A lot of those places don't know about how to protect the reef. And it's similar in Sri Lanka. But again, the people are like, you, you really value your wildlife and your conservation. And this is, is something that we can really grip onto. And the two key issues are the fisheries um, of, and coral mining for lime are kind of big major things and coral reef ecosystems are some of the most sensitive ecosystems on the planet they like an optimum temperature they don't you know any form of pollution can cause a really big problem for the ecosystems and so something like coral mining if you take away living coral and dead coral obviously it's gonna it, it takes generations for it to recover and with if we could help implement alternatives and and kind of educate the people that are doing this that there are other ways that you can say obviously get lime into agriculture and and the construction industry it's all about a, a balance of maintaining the economy for those elements but protecting the beauty and the wildlife that, that you're surrounded with um, another major issue is the sedimentation so when you're nearer to built up areas um, 
obviously the sedimentation's high, you get runoff, you get dirt going into the, the ocean, and it just lays on top of the marine of, of the corals. And with that, without that, effectively the reefs can't breathe. So there's a lot of things we could do to really encourage that. And people within diving love doing conservation as well. So you've got the pristine reefs, which are further away from built up areas, but as you get closer to the built up areas, there are really good elements that when it comes to tourism, people would be really passionate about coming and maybe participating in a marine conservation program. And I think if we could implement something that balances between maybe um, obviously educating people, like going and even going into schools with youngsters doing some fun presentations about the good and the bad, like what can happen to marine ecosystem and how, how to protect it because they're the next they're the people that are going to be the next people to drive and tell their mum and dad did you know this happens to the reef um, and and that education is so important to, to to help make a difference but also get the people like get you've got the whale migratories you've got great like huge almost like a big five isn't just on on land in Sri Lanka it's in the sea as well and if people can see we can like really get the promotion out there of these dive sites. You've already got incredible diving, but there's a tourism element is also when it comes to the conservation. And if you could balance all of those around and maybe implement some, you've got the shipwrecks as well. And, but there's, a, there's also a way of maybe putting in some new artificial reefs as well. So like decommissioned buses and things that you could make safe to drop into the ocean and create more safe, dive sites and maybe encourage marine life away or, or as well as on living reefs to those aspects so it can help the fishing culture for, for Sri Lanka as well as protect the marine ecosystem. I think I might have answered everything. So. Yeah absolutely Chris thank you so much for those points I totally agree with you and I think you know one thing that we also need to do as as Sri Lankans and Sri Lankans in the tourism and adventure tourism industry like you said is definitely create a bit more awareness because with awareness is, you know, it helps conservation, it helps tourism, it helps, you know, make Sri Lanka as a number one destination. So I think, thank you very much for those points, especially in terms of education. You're right. There's a lot we can do and a lot that we will try and do in the years to come with that. Definitely. Um, the next uh, question I have is actually for Mr. Jake, uh, Dr. Jake Finfrock Finf from the ATTA. Um, firstly, I would like for you to, if you could just let us know a bit about your organization, uh, the ATTA, based, which stands for the Adventure Travel Trade Association, and the role you'll play within the adventure tourism industry. And I'm sure you would have some, some great statistics and information on adventure travel and the growth over the years. And we'd love for you to share, share that with, uh, with us, Jake, if you can. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Max. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, today. It's actually uh, tonight, I'm in Seattle. Um, so uh, it, it's wonderful to uh, be with a group of like-minded practitioners, people who are passionate about adventure and also about conservation and preserving our natural resources and developing tourism in a way that is healthy and sustainable for uh, the people who are participating. And I think most importantly, the destinations where these adventures take place. Um, so the ATTA is a global organization of over 1300 member companies. Uh, we have about 6,000 members if you, if you extrapolate um, that to the, uh, the membership of each company. And um, we believe that uh, travel can be a force for good. And um, we uh, specialize in uh, research and education for the adventure travel community and also in global events. Uh, we have an annual event called the Adventure Travel World Summit, uh, where we gather around a thousand people in a different destination. And uh, their operators, uh, inbound, outbound, uh, gear companies, accommodations, they get together and, uh, and go on adventures for four or five days prior to business meetings. Then we get together and we learn together. We have uh, opportunities for collaboration and, and connection and, uh, and also for development and growth. So um, I'm going to put uh, a link to our website in the chat, if that's okay, Max. We offer um, 
what's called a community membership that's completely free uh, for people who are interested, might want to get to know the ATTA a little bit more. And uh, this has come about during the times of, of COVID-19. We wanted to be able to offer our services and, um, and uh, our expertise to people throughout the world, uh, even though we're not able to in attend in-person events. And so I'll go ahead and put that in, in the link. And if people want, they can explore a little bit more about what the ATTA has to offer. But there's two, two things that I would highlight. One is community. We are a global community uh, of like-minded adventure uh, travel enthusiasts. And so you get everything from, from hardcore uh, adventure mountaineering expeditions uh, all the way to sort of more soft uh, type of adventures where they're entry level sorts of sports. Um, some of the, my co-panelists here were mentioning, you know, culture. Uh, we say our, in terms of what is adventure, we say it's, some, it's whatever it is, it involves nature, culture, and some sort of outdoor activity. And, uh, and so we have a, a pretty, pretty wide definition. Um, and uh, the second thing that we do is we provide expertise. And uh, this, is, this comes in the form of research, uh, training, and certification courses. Uh, we have uh, online now uh, courses for uh, safety and risk management, business operations for the adventure travel uh, business. Um, we have uh, other guide training uh, courses that are available. We, we were doing all these in person and we've pivoted a little bit to do some of them virtually now. And we're hoping that quite soon we can get back to the in-person events and, and education as well. So, uh, and then we also have something called destination development. So a destination such as Sri, Sri Lanka that really wants to uh, improve their infrastructure and uh, become a player in the global adventure travel uh, market. Uh, we have tools and processes to, to help um, destinations uh, do that and then have access to this global community. Yeah, thank you so much, Jake. I mean, absolutely, please do share that link in the chat because I think for everyone here and everyone in Sri Lanka, you know, it's it will be brilliant for us to, you know, get on board and really help uh, use this time, especially with, I mean, virtually no tourism to really help, you know, get our standards up, get our... Um, yeah, get our standards and get our uh, get our standards and quality to a world, you know, a level that will make us almost number one in the world. So thank you so much, uh, Jake, uh, for that. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of people that will have a lot of questions after this and who will be gladly joining up uh, with your member, with your community membership. So thank you so much. Um, the next question I have is for Julian Carnell, the co one of the co-founders of Large Minority. Um, and the Lanka challenge, a tuk tuk challenge which happens in Sri Lanka. Um, Julian, just why don't you just tell us a bit about the Lanka challenge, how you came up uh, with the concept and how you, uh, and the story of how you grew the event uh, over the years and then diversified into different locations. Hi, Max. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the intro. Yeah, qu quite a panel to follow um, and great insight so far. The Lanka challenge, was a journey that started uh, probably around 2006 or 2007 um, in the back of a rickshaw in the middle of some of the places that the panelists have already, already mentioned in Sri Lanka, some, somewhere probably around the Knuckles re region where I borrowed someone's rickshaw or someone's tuk-tuk um, and just decided to take it for a few days. Um, and f instantly fell in love with the destination and the mode of transport, um, going to Peter's point on passion, I think a lot of people um, talk about how projects start um, and took to turn into a passion project of mine very early on. Um, and that's how the Lanka Challenge was born. Um, for those of you who don't know, we take travelers from all over the world um, that come to Sri Lanka a few times a year and then um, use that platform, the Tuk Tuk, to, to discover the, the, the hidden nooks and crannies of, of Sri Lanka as uh, as an amazing destination and experience all the things that everyone's mentioned already the food the culture um, the people um, but using the tuk tuk as a, as an amazing platform for that um, that's how our journey that's how our journey started so you know the first event was actually just as the the, the civil war ended in in two thousand nine and we've been doing it ever since really um, bringing people from all over. Um, discover Sri Lanka and as you mentioned yeah there's now since been been quite a few other versions of, of, of Tuk Tuk rallies and adventures 
um, which is which is great because we, we truly believe it's one of the best platforms. Um, as I say, a platform to, to, to visit the country um, and, and we love it. And it, it's yeah, a, a passion project. Um, I, I would just say to, to people just to add a little bit on on generally i assume there's people who are interested in starting have started run their own businesses and adventure travel but one i've noticed a lot in sri lanka is with certain operators especially small operators um and when it comes to adventure travel is offering a huge a huge range of um of of offerings um across the adventure sector and, and i would really encourage people um to to really focus on what, what what's their niche and what they're really good at and and back to their passion because that that's really what will make them experts in that field um and and i think using organizations like like the atta are, are a great way to to learn about about those things so yeah i hope i've answered your question there Sorry about that. I was on mute. Yeah, thank you so much, Julian. Yeah, that that was brilliant. Uh, Mr. Virasinghe, did you have a question previously? Sorry, I think I accidentally missed it out. I think you're on mute, Mr. Virasinghe. Wait. Comment uh, a bit about the Chris uh, uh, diving experience. Chris, we do dive. We are a, a very old Paddy Gold Palm title. And we actually look after underwater. Um, you know, we do a lot of uh, research. We, we uh, even uh, some of our dive sites are. We don't allow an anchor to be anchored. We have our underwater base anchors in the sites. All the sites are properly managed. Most of the sites, I would say, most of the sites. So we have to follow the. Uh, I'm sure you are aware of uh, Paddy Gold Palm status. So yeah, to okay. have a good gold palm status, you have to follow certain rules and regulations, including your equipment. We are into that. I just want to share with you because we have a lot of diving school around the country. Most of us are professionals and we do a lot of wreck dives. And also we do uh, uh, some of the deep dive with the uh, trimix and uh, with, uh, you know, the different diving style. I don't want to go to the uh, <laughs> detail of technology. But the diving is little different to Maldives because Maldives, you have a more visibility. But we have a less visibility, but still we are talking about 15, some days, 20 meters. So it's, it's lovely and good dive size. And we have a lot of reefs. And those reefs are uh, actually, we don't have a, that many drop-off. They are all, you know, we can gradually go into the deep. So this is one of the best sites for beginners at the same time for professionals as well. A lot of sharing with you because that you were touched on diving. And we do a lot of diving throughout the year uh, at Southwest Coast and East Coast. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Mr. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for, for those uh, insights. I think I had a follow-up question as well for you, Mr. Virasinghe. If, uh, I mean, you have been involved in various adventure tourism events that you mentioned, the Colombo, uh, Colombo Marathon, uh, Rumble in the Jungle, uh, the Teacup. Just tell us a little bit about these events and the importance of Sri Lanka as a destination, I think, bringing in these high profile sporting and, uh, and a mix of sporting and adventure based events. When you are looking at leisure sports, you have an event for mass participation. So Colombo Marathon is an event for mass participation. We have a, a professional run. Within the professional marathon, you have a fun run. That is 5K, 10K, half marathon, and then the full marathon. We have professionals are, uh, you know, actually uh, participating in the full marathon. Then the, uh, the leisure or the one who want to come into the sport, who want to participate, they are actually enjoying the other, uh, the semi-event. Then when we take UCI Teacup, that is another event, but where only professionals can participate. So UCI ranking event, only the ranking professionals can get uh, into the event. So we have 15 uh, teams. We give only one or two teams to Sri Lanka and the others are from, from all over the world. So they have to be qualified to get in. And also this is participating here they get their rank as well. Rumble in the jungle, 
is another event. We are starting from almost like uh, two meters above the uh, sea level. And first day, that is again, uh, selected professionals are participating in that. So the first day, we are gaining 1,600 meters. Our journey to gain 1,600 1, feet, and they do a lot of, sorry, 1,600 meters, but they are doing a lot of ups and downs. So that event is the the professionals are finishing like even within the professionals, the top ones like Napoleons or even one from Switzerland, top rank in uh, in Germany, they are finishing within uh, four or five hours. The last one will finish within eight hours. So this is a kind of a, a event we have. This is a range of event. In adventure, you have a lot of different um, events, but these events also have their own kind of a style with the different uh, different gaps. Take surfing. We have a professional two surfing event that we involve. One is world world qualifying series at Karugambe in the East Coast. So where we have again 123 participants from all over the world. Some of them are within top 50 surf rankers in the world. So you get from America, but those are ranking events. And then we have an event where we can have a, where every, anyone can participate. The so all professionals come and take their slot and then they participate. So we do have a different event. At the same time, we want to introduce more events. And uh, we have to be also careful by managing the area because some of our surf sites are wild surf site. We don't have that many infrastructure around the site. So we would like to keep that nature as well. So we try to educate all the surfers. We try to educate local community to manage the center. So likewise, we are doing a lot of different activities. And uh, uh, I'm sure that uh, there are more professionals. They can come out with their input and uh, hiking, biking, canoeing, kayaking, or the multi-activity trails can be uh, you know, one of the uh, famous trails in the country. Absolutely. Especially in the leisure tourism. Absolutely, Mr. Virasinka. I think, Dilan, you had something to add on to that? I did Sorry, I was on mute. No worries. Um, can you... Um, I think what uh, Tilak mentioned is very important. I think um, there is plenty of options for us to um, go into a segment called uh, stage running races. Because if you look at the adventure calendar, there are over 300 to 400 various types of adventure events that happens uh, globally. But I think um, Rumble in the Jungle is the only event that uh, uh, Sri Lanka hosts. So likewise, there's so much of opportunity for us to um, look into these adventure events. There are, you know, uh, uh, trail running is one of the fastest growing sports in um, Europe at the moment. And there's lots of uh, events uh, which happens around that. Um, so I think that that's also a, a good segment to really focus on. And um, cycling is something that we can really look into because I think uh, the difference in altitude uh, gives cycling um, uh, enthusiasts a better option in terms of their challenges. Um, if you look at our TA states, there are plenty of old cycling paths that can be used as sing single track or double track um, cycling events could be done in those areas. So there's plenty of options available in, in terms of those uh, event-based uh, tourism. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, Diran. I think, you know, I think just another point, I think from, uh, if, if I'd ask a question from Julian, who excels in running these, I would say, mini uh, event-based, um, event-based uh, events, uh, adventure tourism events, what do you, what have you seen, for example, as in terms of demographics, have you seen any change over the years? Uh, because I think what we've seen is more people nowadays are, you know, uh, into their fitness, into coming into, adv uh, into adventure. And what do you say makes a successful event from your experience on the Lanka Challenge and 
across the Amazon, etc. Um, to answer your first question, I think they, there's probably probably some sort of misconception that adventure travel is associated with young, energetic, fit people. Um, and that you have to be between the age of kind of 18 and, and 30 to, to, to consider adventure travel, which is absolutely, you know, it's a myth. Um, there's, you know, it, just from our events, we, we did we did start with a slightly young, younger audience. I think um, I think perhaps the perhaps the perception of driving a tuk tuk was seen as something really adventurous, and you need to be young and and ready to engage. But very quickly, I think this this also became a myth, and 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 our audience has has yeah has changed. Uh, it's it's a big mix. It's changed a lot. It's got considerably older. You'd be surprised. I mean, we had our oldest participant on the Lanka Challenge. I think she was seventy nine years old. Um, so if you can imagine her drive, you know, some some lady who you, you would assume, well, no, she's not going to drive a rickshaw around Sri Lanka, a thousand kilometers in a tuk tuk, seventy nine year seventy nine year old lady, and um, you know, it, it just it's testament to 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 that to that statistic and and that that adventure is it can be for everybody. And, and going back to what um, what Jake mentioned that the, the, it's such a broad spe- spectrum of what a, adventure can be defined as um you know one man's adventure is, is crossing the road and the next man's adventure is, is climbing climbing mount everest so it, it's um it, it is for everybody um I, I think i'm sure you'll see from from people that have amazing stats on this kind of stuff people like the atta um you you'll see that it's one of the fastest growing sectors within the industry um, and that's probably testament to the fact that it just covers such a wide, such a wide audience. Um, and people are naturally becoming more inquisitive, more adventurous themselves um, to discover new things, things that traditional tour operators and providers have almost themselves steered them away from because they put them on buses and put them in specific hotels and specific destinations. So as this kind of this strong stronghold breaks free and people travel more independently um then the emphasis emphasis moves to the operators themselves the people in the destinations to to provide what people are looking for to provide these these great adventures in in, to standards that people are used to possibly where they are uh, where they're from and and once there's kind of acceptance that this can be done safely and and well then yeah that it opens doors to, to to all sorts of things Brilliant, Julian. Thank you. Thank you for those points. Um, I think another key message that goes around in the adventure tourism and in tourism in general nowadays is sustainability. And I would like to ask maybe an open question, I think mainly based at Stuart Peter and maybe even Julian, you'd have something to say about this. How important is sustainability in terms when you're organizing um, adventure tourism and giving back to the local communities? I Maybe... I'm happy to start on, on that just to give my personal opinion on it um, because it's it's been a very um, it's been an interesting journey uh, for us um, ourselves there's a lot of statistics out there that that, that say or, or indicate that everybody is obsessed with sustainability and everybody wants to be responsible um, and everybody really cares about the environment and everybody you know really should look after the places they're going but actually when it comes to when it comes to paying the money um, unfortunately this is the statistics also show that that it's you know that's where it that's where it stops in a lot of in a lot of instances so i i personally believe that that sustainability um really begins at, at home and the person that's operating if they have an ethos if the people operating the trips have an ethos um to 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 make that a large part of their business and an important part of the business then that that really paves the way for, for something truly sustainable and, and something that people can really follow and then appreciate. Um, that, that, that's my, 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 my take on it. I'm sure there's some others that have some insight. Yeah, thank you, Julian. I think Stuart, Peter, I mean, you all have done tremendous amounts in Papua New Guinea and across the world. I think Chris as well, have some, you had something to say about that? Yeah, go on, Chris. Yeah, when it, when it comes to sustainability, I think, 
like you say, if, if it's going to cost a lot of money, then people, like the statistics on it, everyone's like, you know, you watch the Blue Planet series in the UK, suddenly everyone's like, oh my God, there's plastic in the ocean, like they didn't know kind of thing. Um, but it has to start from the company and it's got to start, it's like, you know, like the government's, you know, re telling people to reduce plastic and, and all those elements within it. Sustainability, if it doesn't have to be, doesn't have to court make things more expensive from my view i think it's just about making those small changes which are possible to a to a tour for for example plastic water bottles if everybody drunk you know in a hot climate 10 500 milliliter um, plastic water bottles throughout a tour over 10 days you, that's every single person then traveling is using 100 bottles times that by you know two million visitors from the UK, it, it becomes a huge number over a long, over this period of time. And, it, and it's just making those small changes like that don't necessarily cost that much to make the change with just a simple thing as reusable um, water source and things that, that can make a big difference as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yes. Can I, Max, yeah, I just wanted to say, um, yeah, I guess sustainability is um, a very complex issue and, and, and there's the environmental impact, but also a, um, a social um, a human impact, yeah? And of course, from an environmental impact, yes, um, using uh, reusable bottles for water is a, a perfect example, yeah? But sustainability from a a social or a, a people aspect is super important. So that's uh, using or um, employing local guides, for example, um, that may, for example, and now this may not necessarily be the case in Sri Lanka, but places in Borneo where we operate, um, you know, rather than um, chopping down trees, um, we employ them in the tourism industry, for example, and therefore their uh, forest becomes um, um, a money earner for them in perpetuity. They're, that's just one simple example, yeah. So using um, people at the grassroots is really super important for us. Um, using local guides, uh, ornithologists and naturalists and what have you is, is very, very important. And then using maybe smaller hotels, uh, eco hotels that have that same ethos that we have is super important as well. And it doesn't have to cost everything. And um, Sorry, just the very last point. No matter what we do, we're going to have an impact on the planet. Yeah, even just getting to Sri Lanka, we're going to have an impact. Yeah, and we can try to offset some of that. Um, but we can try to reduce it as much as possible. Yeah, and if we can link up with organisations that have the same ethos as us, um, then we can have reduce that impact and make it more sustainable. So it's super important for us, for sure. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um with uh, Chris and with Peter and their statements. Um, you know, it all starts with the individual, but it, we can also extrapolate that to the community and say it all starts with the individual operator. And um, at the ATTA, we, uh, we really encourage a sustainable approach to travel because the opposite of sustainable is unsustainable. And if we're doing things that are unsustainable, none of us are gonna be doing this and we're going to make the environments where we operate worse over time. And um, that's, not, that's not what we want. Um, the ATTA has a couple of uh, resources for people. One is called Tomorrow's Air. It's bulk carbon offsetting and actually carbon storage uh, program that you can look into if you're interested. And then many initiatives. Uh, plastics were brought up. Um, that's one of our, our main um, recent initiatives is to really reduce single use plastic use. Uh, one of our member companies is a company called The Grail. Uh, G-R-A-Y-L, and the Grail um, has a reusable purification bottle that's, that's quick, 15 seconds for uh, uh, three quarters of a liter of water, uh, can be used time and time again, and uh, it you know, purifies uh, bacteria and virus and um, amoeba and you know, any toxins as well. So, uh, you know, there are options out there, and you, as, as if, if you're a, a tour operator or a guide, you can have tremendous impact on the traveler uh, by just modeling. 
um, th this idea and, and, and not preaching at them necessarily or shaming them, but really providing an alternative and, and a thoughtful way and approach to, uh, to how to travel. Absolutely. Thank you, Jake, for that. And um, I think just to add on, um, just to move on from that, I've been receiving a few questions from the audience. And one question I feel that has kept coming up is uh, what do you what do you all think in terms of uh, health and safety would be the best strategy? And if there are any places to go out there to look, uh, to get accreditations, uh, or even have any certain institutes regulating the health and safety standards. I mean, I'll, I'll, I can also start on that. On that, um, I also linked to our journey. I mean, our, our first ever Lanka challenge in two thousand nine. Um, I was obviously a, a naive, um, a slightly naive event organizer, and we started as a race. And, you know, the, 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 if you can imagine trying to operate a Sri Lanka, a tuk-tuk rally as a race, you know, not very safe. Um, lots of things that go, go with that. And so health and safety is a huge part of, of, of improving, of, of um, making things better, making the experience better, and obviously making it, it, it safer. And I hate to almost go and give a sales pitch to ATTA here, but resources that, that are on platforms like that. And I'm sure that there are others in Australia and, and, and various parts of the world. But I have to say though, when you have an, in, uh, um, an industry wide set of guidelines that is, is combined with, um, you know, experts from across the world, putting together their knowledge and experience on all of the activities that we've, we've mentioned today. Um, those, those are really, really valuable um, bits of information and, um, and that, to, so to answer your question, like that's where the, the, the real value is. Um, and they, they, there's hours and hours of work that's got into, into these kind of things to best practices across all kinds of activities, um, risk assessments that, that go in um, just to get a, a kind of baseline of, of, of safe practice. Everybody wants to run safe uh, activities. Nobody wants to hurt anybody, but we want to have a, a adventure along the way. Yeah, thanks Maxim. for that, Don. Uh, Julian, if, if I might just comment, um, there isn't like a global uh, health and safety standard for adventure travel. Um, the ATTA was involved in developing um, ISO standards for uh, guide training, uh, and those uh, are available, those courses. Uh, we do offer currently a safety and risk management um, course that um, is available for people online uh, that you can take uh, and apply those principles to your business. It walks you through all of the aspects that, that you really should consider. And then um, just another note, ATTA has recently published uh, activity specific COVID uh, safe operation guidelines. And there are uh, one overarching guideline for small group operations. And then there are 10 activity specific. So, you, you know, you have, um, you know, rafting, cycling, trekking, and on and on. So uh, feel free to look at those as well. And if I can ever be of a resource to any of you to point you in the right direction, uh, feel free to reach out. Yeah, I think uh, Stuart and, and Thanks. Luck will have you after that maybe to round off. And thank you, Jake. I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions and plenty of information, uh, plenty of questions coming your way on registering and teaming up with the ATTA. ATT, thank you very much. Yes, to it. Thanks, Max. Um, I mean, great conversation and a really important one. I think if we look back and, and uh, evaluate a lot of the accidents that happen in our industry, uh, one thing that, that jumps out is uh, a lot of times people have known there was a risk and didn't speak up. So there is uh, certainly uh, some great uh, uh, tools out there to evaluate the likelihood and consequences, et cetera. But, um, you know, it's if we really focus also on, on the principle of the standard you walk past is the standard you accept. And uh, if you walk past, uh, and, and I'll talk about this as a, a group of industry-based people who are um, passionate about the safety of their guests, if we walk past something and we don't speak up or we don't rectify it and someone gets hurt in the past, we, we only have ourselves to blame as an industry. So I, I just go back to the uh, 
to the to the, the principle of, of speaking up and rectifying things and and having that as a uh, a, a non-negotiable uh, within ourselves as a as an industry. Brilliant, sir. Thank you for that, Mr. Vida Singer. I think you had something to say as well. Yeah, what we did in Sri Lanka for the last two years, last two years with the adventure professionals or expertise, we uh, you know came as a group together with some of the government organizations. We developed a criteria and some guidelines to develop this industry. So some of the guidelines actually we developed certificate course to the national vocational level six that is actually um, uh, the highest we could go at that time. And there we got involved uh, kind of a safety system or we have discussed with the telecommunication regulatory bodies how to communicate with everyone who is in adventure industry, even uh, individual to the, uh, the professionals in the area. And also app to track, apps to track where they are. And also we had discussed with the 1919, that's new uh, ambulance system, which is widely uh, providing their services around the country. We had a link with them. And we have a common center for anyone to call, we, we take that call center and 1912 is the number. So we did all that. And then we started a few classes already under Sri Lanka, um, tourism school. So some of the professionals, they came from the guide lecture association. Some of us are from Slido and from actually all the stakeholders in the industry who involved in the adventure tourism contributed a lot. That is actually two year exercise we did. Unfortunately, just before we uh, finalize some of the activity, we have to face the COVID situation. Even during the COVID situation, we went and helped the Sri Lanka tourism. This team, we were actively involved. But we were more or less uh, in an area to finalize or, or get the international accreditation for some of the activities. So we did some of the work. Unfortunately, we last few months, we couldn't do much. But I'm sure by uh, in a year also, we will end up with the project what we start. This is to make sure that we have a right policy guideline for adventure tourism, that is for underwater, surface sports, sky sports. We don't have a single drop zone in the country for sky sports or for parachuters. So we have to get a special permission if somebody wants to you know, do parachuting in the country. So we discussed with the Air Force and regulatory authorities, and also we discussed some of the matters related to the water with the uh, Navy, and also land-based activities with the police and also with the other security personnel. So we built a quite comprehensive platform, but of course, it is not off the ground as yet. So we, it will come soon. Absolutely, Mr. Veer Singh. Thank you for that in, insight because I think a lot of questions also asking in Sri Lanka for the people, how can they register, how can they come, or, come along to these guidelines so that this is going to be so vital for us going forward and I'm sure through Slido we'll be uh, speaking to all our members in the days to come. Yeah. Thank you so much for your work on this regard and I'm sure everyone's going to really appreciate this coming out and it'll help bring out Sri Lanka as a safe destination for adventure travel, which is one of the major criteria, I think, going forward. And I, uh, can I share a little more, but we have to be careful about the carrying capacity. All what we do to promote Sri Lanka is very nice. We, we can develop, we can even responsible traveler. I'm sure he even won't take a plastic bottle. They have a refilling bottle all over the world. If I go for a little hike or a bike as a responsible, a uh, person, then I, I, you know, follow my guideline. But carrying capacity can be one of the major issues because we, in the place is developed, automatically we get the local people to be a part of the uh, trail or part of the business. So then from there it expands. So some of the area in Sri Lanka we have seen, it has been developed. Uh, then when we try to control it, then unwanted issues may arise. So therefore we have to 
be very careful about carrying capacity of all the sports, including hiking trails or, or any other adventure or the leisure sports. Absolutely. And I think that's adding on to the points you just said about our surfing beaches being pristine and wild. And that is what people come to Sri Lanka for. So it's vital that we really, you know, be, you know, in a, in terms of have a long-term vision and look at, you know, carrying capacity, like you said, and I'm sure that's something that we'll be advocating towards the industry as well. And you have been doing so effectively over the, over the last few years. So unfortunately, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have come to our end. Uh, let me just see if there are any other questions that um, have come up. I think maybe there's a, another question actually, which might be uh, good for our, our foreign panelists. What, what would you say and would you give any advice to Sri Lanka as a destination in terms of marketing and how to market ourselves as an adventure tourism destination going forward? Maxim, I'm, I'm happy to, to kick off because I, I noticed there's some great comments there, one from Claudette, uh, about, um, yes, you are absolutely right. Um, the reputation of Sri Lanka is about its food and its culture, et cetera. Uh, but what a great opportunity for us uh, as a collective group. We're, we're, um, we need something to spearhead the recovery of tourism in Sri Lanka. And collectively, our, uh, our guests, our clientele, accept a element of risk in adventure-based stuff. They're not saying that they are foolhardly, but they, but they are prepared to have a dip. They, uh, you know, when they go on a a tuk-tuk adventure or they go for a, a dive. So I, I really believe that um, when the opportunity arises, if we can utilise uh, this group of people to spearhead the recovery of tourism, uh, that the whole tourist inter industry will, will benefit for that. Absolutely. Thank you, Stuart. Does that be anyone else to add anything on that? Oh, yeah, okay. yes, I do. Add a little bit on that because yeah. it, is, it was mentioned earlier that ad adventure does the moment somebody mentions adventure people think it's like you're going to be dangling off a cliff or something like that but i think with um marketing it's, it's important to say that uh, to emphasize that you can have an adventure without it being it doesn't mean it's an extreme adventure you know even just experiencing culture is an adventure so i think the more that people can be open it's opening people's minds to the to a soft adventure and that can then sometimes bring out the let's say the more let's say medium adventure in somebody to try new things and i think if, if it could be marketed as a way of that especially with sri lanka that has so much on offer you can if a family of four could travel they can all have four completely different um interests one could like diving another one could love wildlife another one could be really interested in you know like the culture and the temples and and you can have all of that in one itinerary in Sri Lanka and that, I think that's part of the beauty of it that can really be expressed yeah thank thank you so much Chris uh on this uh I think Diran you had something to add as well to this yeah um I think um uh, a common question which has been asked uh, from our clients is that if you could in Sri Lanka, can you hike for three to four days without using a mode of transport? I think this is something very important uh, because this gives the element of difference. This is where I think we need to look at um, developing designated hiking and biking trails where people could, you know, hike for maybe two or three nights, um, sleep over in a local community a homestay where it gives the element of them hiking for days without using a mode of transport. Because if you look at some of the um, hiking destinations like Nepal, uh, Norway, all of those destinations does have this uh, option. So I think going forward, uh, we can surely use our natural resources to designate hiking and biking trails so that we could cater to this uh, demand. That's something that I thought maybe to maybe useful to add. Thank you. Absolutely, go on. Yeah. I'm sure you have a lot to say about this. 
Oh, this is the this is the one area that Sri Lanka is lacking at the moment. Yeah, is multi-day. Uh, no, sorry, I don't want to use my company's name, but no roads um, adventures. Yeah, so um, yeah, walking for days, four or five days, four nights, five nights, or biking. This is the one area Sri Lanka lacks. Yep, and but if you look at the map. There is a lot of wilderness and um, a lot of these places that are available because people are, are already walking these trails through these wildernesses, right? Because they're getting from their one family to the other. These are ancient trails. I mean, Sri Lanka is an ancient place, right? There are trails everywhere, but they just haven't been opened yet for tourists to come through and connect to either staying in a homestay, for example, or maybe opportunities for eco lodges to set up like um, a little glamping um, try a, a campsite near the edge of the trail and then you so you walk off the trail stay at the glamping place and walk back in again i mean there's places all over sri lanka for this but it takes um investment it takes government um initiative and investment as well and it takes community Yep, so it takes community engagement and involvement in this area. But Sri Lanka has it, uh, so much of this available. You have these beautiful cliffs, waterfalls, uh, wilderness, uh, and it's all in one place. And then guess what? At the end of the trip, you can stay in a five-star hotel and have a massage and great Sri Lankan food and then go home and go, wow, what just happened to me? I had an awesome adventure, right? It's uh, it's got everything going for it, man. I love the place. Maximi, can I come in for a second? Of course. Did I go. Maximi, we do have a trail. I didn't talk about the business part of it since we are all involved with the different operators. But there are trails even for 14 days in Sri Lanka. There's a trail used by one of the British company. We start from Nigambu to Pasikuda, non-motorized trail. Sleep not only on the, we, we, we have a different uh, setup. Even sometimes we sleep in a sleeping bag, in the temples. So there are, but it is limited, limited, and we are carefully monitoring it and managing it because we don't want to destroy our environment, cultural interest, that is very serious. Because wherever we uh, come across, we, we try to be have our discipline, even our dress code, everything is followed. So we don't want to overexpand those, but for your information, we have a couple of trails from three, four days till about 21 days. They are very specialized, only few operators in the world using us for that. Just to say that it is existing. Yeah, ab Thanks. absolutely. Yeah. I think, yeah, no, I think that part is our uh, very important as well, keeping these trails very uh, hidden in, a, in an aspect. Not only hidden, it is because of the cultural uh, interest and also our people need to be looked after. You see, they are, they are from village, they are in a different community and we shouldn't destroy their life uh, style even though we are, uh, you know, Sri Lankan and we love nature, we must look after them and protect them. Yes. Yeah. May I say one, one closing comment here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, wonderful discussion. I think my only advice, I, I must confess, I have not been to Sri Lanka. Um, I did uh, get an emergency passport from the US Embassy in Co uh, Colombo when it was stolen when I was in the Maldives. So I have a very special place in my heart for Sri Lanka and uh, it's on, on my list to get there as soon as I can. Um, but I would encourage uh, the adventure travel community and, and the the tourism department, the government uh, who regulates tour tourism, uh, to, to be really thoughtful and careful about how you develop tourism. Um, you don't want to sell your soul um, to, to make money. Um, you want to keep that soul and uh, even, even value it more highly than maybe other people will. And uh, I would say don't, don't be afraid to, um, you know, set some standards in terms of uh, you know, uh, foreign travelers coming in, the, the more rare you make Sri Lanka, the, the more um, valuable and, and the more um, enticing it will be to the global adventure travel community because travel is in people's blood. 
Uh, it's going to continue to increase. Some of the stats are, you know, 5% growth for the last 50 years in travel. And that's, you know, wars, floods, uh, you know, 9-11. And it's going to rebound after COVID. It's just going to be a, a little bit different. And then the adventure travel sector is, is growing at 21% year over year growth um, since 2000. So um, if you think about preserving Sri Lanka um, and, and maybe, uh, maybe not making it uh, uh, you know, mass market, maybe focusing on small groups and adventure and, um, and having people pay a premium to get there. Uh, Bhutan is a country that has done that maybe to the extreme and, and perhaps better than any other country. And it, they've really set a high value for traveling there. So that's just a, um, a, a point of advice. We deal a lot in the ATTA with destinations that are wrestling with over tourism and the negative effects. And they're saying we want to move more towards adventure um, to get away from the cruise and the mass tourism industry. So because you're a, a place that's in, in the new stages and, and uh, not too many people are aware, at least that's what I see in the comments here, uh, take advantage of that and, and uh, take a careful and purposeful approach. Absolutely. I think that's, those are some great remarks to close up on. If, I mean, if anyone else has anything to say, uh, I would, yeah, love to open up. Just on one, one particular point, Maxine, there was a question, uh, I think, from Pradeep about ele human-elephant conflict. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I'm by no means an expert at all, um, but I have experienced a lot of that with just uh, old friends from growing up in Kenya. I was born and brought up in Kenya and, and, and you know, e East Africa. And Jake touched it there, like the, the a lot of the strategy that was done through um and granted the wilderness sizes are, are, are very different but a lot of a lot of the, the the focus and the strategy was built on exactly what jake said and i know sri lanka follows that to a certain extent but not 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 uh, widely and that is and that is the exclusivity of it the only way to really uh, in such a um in a small area you know wilderness area where obviously elephants require huge amounts of space is is to limit the the numbers and, and and through through corridors which which they are obviously in Sri Lanka lots but it, it's it's managing those national parks I mean you know park fees in Africa in, in places like Kenya the Masai Mara where the migration is going on now are up to a hundred dollars a day that's already what Sri Lanka is but hey they could probably you know not everyone's going to like to hear this but probably increase it more to, to reduce the numbers um, who knows yeah that was just on that question yeah, and if I could comment on that as well, this um, uh, Kenya, uh, I lived in Kenya for a while as well, Julian, um, and uh, a resident rate uh, was, was much lower. Uh, they provided access to the local community and a non-resident rate was maybe three times the price of a resident rate. And as a foreigner in Kenya, I was very happy um, you know, to, to just have the opportunity. And I think that you'll find that that's the case and uh, you know, have, having the two rates um, is is good. It's it doesn't like, fly it's like in the that already in Sri Lanka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't fly very well in the U.S. Um, no. But um, I, you know, uh, I I would say absolutely um, go that route. Yeah, absolutely. I think we already have a very very big difference between our residents and our uh, tourist rates, which actually does uh, a world of good in one sense. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think uh, that's it. I think we've run out. We've run on a bit extra, but I, I don't think there'll be too many people complaining because we, I think, touched on some very important points. Uh, so I would, firstly, I would like to thank all of you so much, uh, Mr. Tilak, uh, Julian, Stuart, Peter, Chris, Diran, and Jake. Especially, I think, especially Jake, uh, who's up at two thirty in the morning. Uh, just to just to speak to us. I think thank you very much to all of you. Thank you so much to everyone in the audience who's listening, participating, sending in your questions. Uh, we hope this was a good discussion and I